and we are recording in three, two, one. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Dylan's taking over my podcast. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Donna Gift Show. I'm the host. Yeah, Dylan's taking over. Sorry, guys. All right, we're starting that over again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners <laughs> of all ages, 13 and above, 18 and above, Just not, this isn't for kids. Anyways, <laughs> I am your special guest host, Dylan Warder, and I'm going to be interviewing the Donna Gift, the actual host of the <laughs> Donna Gift Show. She has been a baby once upon a time. <laughs> a, a, a emo child in her room stroking a guitar okay singing sad songs i forget <laughs> i'm like was i yeah it was <laughs> she has been a fitness competitor a flight attendant a wife not mine <laughs> uh she has also been a real estate agent and throughout all of that since a very young child was a content creator and still is. Flight attendant too. Did you say that? I sure did. Oh fuck. And <laughs> <laughs> we are going to be and also has had some wild childhood experiences. So we're gonna cover it all today. We're gonna dive in and the reason why we're doing this is because she never talks about herself and in most cases refuses to, so I'm going to extract all the information that you guys want to know about <laughs> her and make her talk about it. And we're gonna dive deep. So, Donna, everybody wants to know. Let's start from the beginning. <laughs> this is like a talk show. How is your current sex life? <laughs> That's what you want to start. Everybody wants to know this. Clearly, I think this might just be a you question. Um, it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, we're going to start off with childhood. Where'd you grow up? Oh, Palmdale, California. Afro Palmdale. man. Afro man. Why are you referencing Afro man? He's the one who put us on the map. Palmdale? On the map. Put Palmdale on the map. P on the map. So he is the pioneer. He is the, set- <laughs> the settler. He's not the but- actual pioneer. You know what the fuck I, I mean. <laughs> all right. So Palmdale. How old were you? Do you were born there? No. Um, Oakland. You were born in Oakland. Mm-hmm. Moved to Palmdale yes. at a very young age. I grew up in Palmdale. Yep. Okay. Majority of my childhood. What life. what age range? From a baby to maybe about eighteen. Okay. Yeah. Walk us through it. How was childhood? Um. Ooh. Well, like, there's a lot of things, I guess. Um. Uh, Anything to report from like zero to ten. Jesus, we. Are, <laughs> I can't recall. Okay. So, from 0 to 10... Uh, Highs, lows, what was the experience kind of growing up in that? That's like the Mm. age range when you're getting programmed. So, like, maybe Uh. a little bit about your family, where they're from. Oh, yeah. um, To kind of give a little bit of that about the culture that you kind of grew up in. Cool. So, I'm Filipino, if you guys didn't know that. So, my both my parents are from the Philippines. My dad was first of our family to bring our family to the states basically so he did that by being in the navy and went back home married my mom and my mom has only ever had one boyfriend who is my dad so she is a one and done type of woman and he brought her to the states and from there she planted her seeds (laughs) which is me and my brother and she planted her seeds or he planted his seeds in her and then and then she and then, plant, and yeah. then the doctor harvested you out of her <laughs> <laughs> it was a very strange way to put it but yes that's basically what happened <laughs> okay <laughs> never looked at it like that but i actually sex ed taught me that so it, i grew up with just me and my brother mostly we were very my parents always had a community they always found the other filipinos i don't know how it's like they have a radar for it but um Polo, maybe yeah they're just out there screaming for filipinos there's actually a filipino call it goes filipino <laughs> <I'm just kidding>. okay <laughs> i'm kidding is your brother um, younger older older so yeah he's older he's about three years older than me and yeah we had a pretty like solid 
it, you know, growing up, it wasn't, I mean, we didn't grow up rich by any means. We were definitely like figuring it out in the States. And it was like paycheck to paycheck <clears throat> or like comfortable, but like the comfort could change at any moment. It was definitely the second. It was comfortable, but we didn't spend anything beyond our means. We were like Goodwill shoppers. That's where we shopped at um, or hand-me-downs. But a lot of our strain did come from my dad always sending money back to the Philippines. Like kind of in a at a point where it was difficult for us to kind of get by because he would give so much away. And so I remember my parents arguing a lot about my dad not, you know, caring for his immediate family. And um, I don't really know what was going on at the time. I just knew that my mom was always upset at my dad giving away our money. Um, oh, and I grew up with a lot of daycare kids. So my mom had her own business and she took care of like, I think there was like at one point 10 of us. Which is actually kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean that was pretty fun. I was I <laughs> I was a bully. <laughs> I was a bully at that age, like pretty young um, in so grade you, school. So you've always been an asshole. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm nice now. <laughs> I had to forgot. get it out okay. of my system. Actually, you know what? I think I was always nice. I just had a lot of issues going growing up. And a lot of jealousy because my parents would give a lot of attention to this other girl. I remember her name, Shadell. Boomagot, if you're here listening. Um, Boomagot. <laughs> Boomagot, blah, blah. So yeah, she <laughs> they would give they would give a lot of attention to her because she was always, you know, a good kid. She'd come home, she'd do her homework, have it all finished and ready. And I would be fucking around, you know, playing outside in the dirt, catching worms and trying to race them in the sewer. Um, I was always a weird kid. <laughs> I'm going to ask the hard question. Okay. Was she prettier than you? No. I don't think so. I don't know. I could be wrong because every <laughs> beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But... Or the beer holder. Yeah. I mean, I was always like the... I hate to fucking say it, but I wasn't bad looking growing up and I, I've never been horrible. Well, you know what, though? I did have an ugly duckling stage. I was fucking horrible horrid at like five or six I, mean, I had a unibrow you had a unibrow i had a unibrow a gap in my teeth people called me madonna because i had the madonna gap <laughs> <laughs> and then because i had a unibrow and i was so insecure about it i remember shaving it you'd be like the filipino sookie from true blood yeah basically let's, oh my god i forgot let's, about let's her that picture right here <laughs> filipino sookie you grew up with a lot of uh, not foster kids, but um, daycare, daycare kids. Mm -hmm. Did that, what kind of like, that create any insecurities for you? Or is that kind of where some of that jealousy came from? How did that change the dynamic with your family? I just asked you three questions, so pick one. <laughs> so I guess it did, I feel like maybe it did translate to some of the jealousy because I always felt like the bad kid. Because my parents were always like, oh, well, why don't you be more like Shadell? And she does her homework on time. And and you're like, I had A's, which was insane. I was I was always getting A's. So I just didn't see the point in doing my homework right when I got home when there was other things I was interested in, like toys and playing outside. And my grades were good, so I didn't fucking care. And I think my parents kind of just... Uh, you know, they're traditional Asian parents. They wanted me to become a nurse. They wanted me to be really good in school. And this was our shot in America. And that that should have been that I, I don't know. There's a lot of weight on my shoulder, I feel, <clears throat> for being like first generation. And not only that, our family back at home, when we would actually jump on the phone calls with them, the first thing, I remember there was one point where I hadn't talked to my grandma in like six, seven years. Not one fucking word. And they finally like put her on the phone with me. And her first question was, are you going to send money? Like that's, yeah. <laughs> How old were you? Um, at that point I was like old, I was older. I was like, I don't know, 18 maybe. <laughs> and she wanted to know if you were going to send her money. Yeah. Oh yeah. They, that was like always the topic of conversation. Like when am I going to send money? When am I going to help support the family back at home? And I probably had only seen them a handful of times at this point. So it was very like, I felt like a, like 
a lot of weight and kind of a cash cow without any emotional attachment. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's also why I, I was just, I was bullied a lot. And so I think I bullied the daycare kids because I felt like that was my, my space, you know? I felt like that was my place I could control mm. because I was the daycare provider's daughter. Ah, that's something I think I just now realized. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Do you feel like that translates to or translated to how your relationship, relationships developed as a teenager and into your early adult years? Um, I wouldn't say... Maybe the jealousy, on some degree, I would have to dig into that a little bit more. I feel like it actually turned me nicer in a way because I was me like when I was mean to these kids, it was fun and games for a little bit. But then I started seeing some of the darker sides result from my bullying with these kids. And then I think there was something in me that I was like, holy fuck, I didn't think that they would be crying like I remember there was one point where me and my brother both had two different clubs right he had the boys club I had the girls club and we were not allowed in each other's club our club was like two people in it including ourselves like one person it was basically our best friend and uh I remember making Shadell fucking go there was we had these two trees in our front yard and there was a branch that was like sitting just above the other branch where you could, if you tried and like were brave enough, you could actually step down into this other branch and cross the other tree and go down. And so that was one of my initiations I thought would be really cool. And I made Shadell go up there. It was like super peer pressure to the max. I'm like, if you don't fucking do this, you're not cool. She really just wanted to be my friend. Now that I think about it, I feel really bad. She even wanted like my gel pens and I didn't let her copy me. Like I was, I was not nice. And so I forced up this tree and made her cross. And I remember her getting stuck at the branches because she couldn't find the branch underneath. And she starts crying, bawling her eyes out. She's traumatized, like just frozen in fear. And she hasn't been inside a tree since. (laughs) Probably not. And I, I like, I didn't know how to soothe talk. It was more of an aggressive, like, get the fuck down here. Stop being a baby. From those stories, I have so many stories of when I was a bully. <laughs> so many stories. But yeah, so from those times when I was a bully, I think I, it kind of internally hurt me more than I realized. I don't think I actually consciously recognized that it was not good, but it felt on a gut instinct way that I shouldn't be picking on these kids. Interesting. So that carried into like what age do you feel like that started to fade? Mm, probably like teenage years. I think when I started to <laughs> get interested in boys, I didn't really have a care about uh, boys. Yeah, boys <laughs> for sure. Boys compared to what an actual man is. <laughs> get some points there. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say probably around teenage. I'd say like fourteen, fifteen. Okay, and then you were interested in boys until about 31. <laughs> yes. And then finally decided to be interested in men. Yeah. Got it, okay. Uh, so back to, to that. Okay, so right around that time period, um, from what I understand, there was some more so challenges at home with your parents, their relationship, and things of that nature that started to kind of take a toll on you. Is that correct? Mm. You know, I find it so fascinating that when I talk about my childhood, instinctually, I block out the most traumatizing things that happened, aka my dad cheating and probably still cheating to this day (laughs) on my mom multiple times and catching him multiple times and my mom never leaving, which is which was interesting because when they were together they did not seem like they would fight a lot. They were like a very happy couple. I remember some mornings I would watch my mom chase my dad around the counter and they're just like, play. they're playful and fun. They would host these karaoke events. They would mm-hmm. drive old people out to mm-hmm. Vegas. And it was just, it was cool, like watching them interact. But then my dad was also in the Navy. So when he would leave, cause he left, um, 
all throughout the week and would come home on the weekends, maybe every other weekend. And he had a whole other life. He had a whole girlfriend. He had like, I think that girlfriend had a kid. I There's just a lot of details that are not never, I never really learned about, but I did, I can still imagine her face because we found a cell phone in my dad's car and it had pictures of him and her all over it. And he said that that was the cell phone he was going to give me for my birthday, that it was like actually supposed to be a gift. <laughs> so my dad was very good at, I won't say very good at hiding it, but they, I mean, he seemed happy at home. So I guess I was confused. I think there's a potential that he wasn't sending that money to the Philippines. Oh, oh, I never thought of it like that. I didn't that is so just now. That's a question that I would love to ask my dad. I don't know if he'd be honest with me though, because even now when my mom brings up how my dad has cheated or is a cheater, he kind of just brushes it off and calls my mom like says that my mom my mom's acting up. And she kind of just does this like look. I don't I don't know how to explain it. It's kind of like a a uh, helpless look, I'll say. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you think about he's gone for a week, two weeks at a time, come home, comes home bi-weekendly, mm-hmm. and is sending all this money somewhere, like, is there any confirmation of that if he's operating, like, and running the finances? Right? Is your mom even looking at that? There's arguing, like, yeah. how accurate is your memory about what they're arguing about, where that money was being sent. Yeah. You know? Could very well be. And I mean, my mom used to, she used to show me her secret stash because she always prepared a way out. Like, she planned on it for sure. Or at least had an idea that she wanted to leave the relationship. But her excuse was always, obviously, me and my brother couldn't leave us until we were older, which that still never happened. But she would always take me into the room. She had this envelope of just stacks of cash. And she was always like, never give your everything to one person, always protect yourself. And she was always showing me how to, I guess, preserve myself in the case that I ended up with a man who was dishonest. And so I think that that kind of caused a trigger no i don't want to say a trigger in me but a personality trait that was developed in me to protect myself and actually go into that survival mode which is why i can totally see why i was so masculine for the longest time and the whole didn't need no man that was absolutely a thing interesting what was the the rest of your relationship like with your mom i know there's some like resentment there of how she handled things uh yeah um there was definitely a resentment towards my mom which sounds kind of silly and also kind of wrong to have resentment towards from what i see the victim but the what i the reason why i felt resentment towards her is because she never left and I didn't think she was strong enough to because she talked about it a lot and never took any action. And I think what I gathered, I'm like, well, he's literally hurting you all the time. My mom was suicidal. I've seen her like, and I don't know if I can even say this or maybe I'll have to take it out, but for the sake of right now, (laughs) um, yeah, I've seen her like hold a knife up against her her stomach here and like was pushing against her stomach she would wake us up in the middle of the night and say her goodbyes multiple times this has happened i've seen her break plates on her head fucking just losing her shit because of my dad cheating and after watching all of this and her still choosing not to leave i started to get resentful of the fact that she wasn't strong enough to leave and so i always told myself above all else i don't need love i don't need anything i'm just gonna have my career and focus on what makes me happy and i won't rely on anyone else for that happiness 
and that's kind of that kind of just developed over the years did you ever try to look at the perspective of because there's i understand the perspective you have 100 percent makes sense mm -hmm. but from an outside perspective if i'm looking at different ways to see it i also see strength i see the strength in her staying for you for your brother now there's also the that is a from a selfless point of view mm -hmm. right where it's like i'm going to endure this pain yeah so that i can be there for them but there's also the point of view of it's the only man she ever had loved or even been with yeah actually from what i understand like intimately and i mean i i definitely took some time to get there but that was a realization i had just these past couple months mm -hmm. i'm 31 years old so yeah i mean i had to sit deep and it's actually when i started to overcome my jealousy and things with you is when i dove into that perspective so maybe a few months now at this point like six seven months um but yeah i definitely see the strength in how great of a fucking mom she was and like how much she put up with just to continue to be in our lives moving from the philippines my dad being the only man person that she knew and and was close to i don't think she had a super solid support system she had friends out here but you know as deep as friendships go at that age and and you know in that time era i don't know if it's the same depth as our relationships now so if i think of it on a scale of how my relationships used to be when they weren't as connected and developed there was definitely no one to turn to mm -hmm. and so she i feel like she didn't have that support system and also back then and probably very much still my parents belief they like divorce is not an option it's actually a disgrace it seems like that can create a safe space for a man to cheat though oh yeah i mean if you think about it back in the day that's exactly what it was women were not allowed to voice their opinion and if they got divorced even if the man cheated it's the woman's fault um something you should watch guys if you're watching marvelous miss Maisel. it's a good comedy show she's a woman who's like up and coming in her comedy career and in the beginning it shows her husband cheats on her with his secretary and he ends up leaving her and literally the parents her friends everything is like well don't tell anybody he's left you and you don't want to end up like the divorce person and they have like a corner for the divorce people it was a disgrace if your husband left you so even if the man was the cheater so that's an opening to how the disconnect is for women and being empowered as a woman there's a lot of I mean, we just earned our right to vote a hundred years ago. That's a long time for a character to development um, it, to have been growing. that long? About a hundred years, <clears throat> I believe. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of things that that come into being a woman, and even now, like that's a whole different fucking podcast which I could talk to you about because I I've read a lot about um, women rights, especially now with the transgender trying to claim themselves as women again is taking away more women power and it's just giving power back to the biological man. I don't know. Anyways, this goes in deeper, but. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, we had a conversation weeks or months back and we're talking about your father and, uh, you know, this topic specifically. And I had said, you know, if you're gonna blame him for all the bad, then make sure you also blame him for all the good. So I guess when it comes to both your mom and your dad, is although seeing how she handled his behavior and the back and forth, and then but also seeing them how they showed up on a daily basis, and then the contrast of it all, is there anything that they either individually or together gave you that you are really grateful for? Hmm. Oh gosh, everything, everything. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. I wouldn't be here in the States if it weren't for my dad taking initiative to bring my mom out here and have us. 
I guess more specifically in in the midst of that experience with the the cheating and the seeing the relationship develop and yeah I think with my dad I think overall just more of his personality trait that was very much uh I I absorbed his personality which was always happy-go-lucky dreamer um super social butterfly and so there was a lot of his personality that I definitely see in me. There was a point where I was just closer to my dad because I felt like I related more to him. He was just always fun. And, you know, he did his best. But as far as the cheating, I don't know if I see any positive in that. I don't. I think that's something I would have to dive in deeper to send love to it. But I think the love that I have for my dad was is more so in who he is as a person outside of him cheating. Do you feel like maybe because you saw the pain that he put your mother through, maybe what you took from that was a preference of who you didn't want to become? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I think that that made me for sure not want to cheat or not want to hurt somebody in the way that I've seen my mom hurt. And yeah, that just, I think that that's carried throughout my relationships, really. Do you feel like there's very specific things that you carried into those first few long-term relationships that maybe um, made them very difficult or made them more complicated or things that you just carried in that you weren't necessarily aware of that now you are aware of? Oh, yeah. (laughs) The trauma. (laughs) I definitely carried in the jealousy, the paranoia of my dad, you know, well, the person I was dating cheating. Like, and then not only that, because I grew up in a very uh, impoverished place or area or whatever, I'd say still fairly middle class, but, you know, there was a lot of ghetto stuff that happened. Even then, like the men in that uh, demographic are very mine. They're very uh, controlling. Controlling. They're damaged, right? When you're damaged, you fight for control. And so when you're in a relationship with a man who grows up in a impoverished area with no self awareness, no consciousness, it's like, or they're not conscientious. I always can never say that word. Um, they fight to control what they can, which they believe they control you as a woman. So they would not, I wouldn't be able to hug other guys. Actually, um, like hugging guy friends was so new to me until I was an adult. Because when I would see people do it, even when they're in relationships, I'm like, your man's cool with that? Like, oh, you you guys are cool having opposite or same sex friendships? Like obviously to some degree, but you know, I, I'd never seen that before because all the men I dated were controlling. So that coupled with believing that all men cheat because my dad was my main example. Yeah, example <clears throat> I was hyper jealous. Like I would, I would freak out, hyperventilate. Like it was not good. It was very destructive to my health, my mental. Do you feel like that controlling element or trait within the men that you were dating originally was that more environmental uh, environmental because of the area that they grew up in or more so cultural conditioning from is that from what i understand is a lot of hispanic culture is very much that way as well but well I think there could definitely be some environmental in that too i think it's both uh where when i was growing up i didn't have a type I it wasn't just Hispanic it wasn't just white it wasn't just black like I've I've dated different races different cultures so I don't know if I would necessarily say that uh, but it depends on how they grew up with their home as well but definitely this conversation displays right right definitely the environment um, plays a role because we all were young damaged not enlightened i think a lot of people can relate to that honestly and whether you grow up in a super wealthy part of town or a very impoverished side of town the fact 
of the matter is, is that generation didn't know how to communicate and didn't know how to allow their children to communicate. So it was either you're wealthy and you're telling your kids they're fucking lazy and they're not doing things right and that causes them to shut down or you're impoverished and impoverished and you're telling your kids like, there is no hope for you. There's no way out. Like they just didn't know how to communicate things. They couldn't sort out their emotions. So how did we expect to? Yeah, I think also in, like in that type of environment or upbringing, the expression of love can be confusing mm, or yeah. absent. And so that, I think, creates insecurities, which insecurities then create the desire for control. Mm-hmm. So I think that can definitely play a role. I think it played a role for me, too. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, so you carried that into those relationships Mm-hmm. Did that with each relationship? Did it start to lessen? Did it kind of was it a roller coaster? How did that all play out to bring you to the point you're at now? It was all an unconscious roller coaster. Um, Even through your marriage? Yes, absolutely. And it wasn't until this past year when I decided to do the real work with you because I feel like you created a space enough to well there's two things one you created a safe space where I felt like I could explore that deeper seated injury that I felt like you would stick around even if it got really dark and then just you know from the way you handled some of our arguments and then two also just reaching a point in my life where it's like I finally am recognizing a pattern that needed to be broken and I'm confident enough to approach this with the tools that I have, you know, acquired over time that even if you did leave, this was something I needed to explore for myself anyways. So, but until then, which was not that long ago, probably a year ago, maybe is it a year ago? Year and a half. About a year ago, yeah. Well, when I started doing the deep deep dive, probably about a year. year. Yeah. Um, that's when I started exploring that. But up until then, I, I was married before you and I absolutely had the jealousy things. I remember like we would have friends come over and if I saw like a friendly gesture, I would hold it inside. But when obviously when you're drinking, it would come out during, you know, partying. And I'm like, oh, like, are you guys hiding something? Is there something that I should actually be aware of? Because I've had friends of mine cheat with me with my boyfriend at the time so that i also have that as trauma as well fuck i forgot about the landscapers <laughs> it's okay i shouldn't pick up it might so anyways uh I forgot what i was talking about what was i saying um just going as far as carrying that through your marriage and then starting to work on it probably six months into our relationship so like the mm. first six months of our relationship was more so becoming aware of those things because before that, it was a very unconscious thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because before, I somewhat blamed my ex. I mean, I, I didn't blame him because it took me it took me two years to get over my ex-husband. Even while I was in a relationship, I remember having sad feelings about my ex-husband. That was the one before you. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I, I think I just didn't realize the amount of I guess responsibility I had to play in that divorce I thought it was him not being romantic enough or not you know taking me out on dates which all of that does play a role obviously but there was a lot of things that I did that caused the trust to not allow growth in that relationship do you feel like maybe from what you witnessed as a child and what you took in or took into those relationships, there was more of a victim mindset of like really kind of seeing it as like, they're doing this, they're doing this, they're doing this, and that's why I feel this way. That's why I'm acting this way. And Mm. then all of a sudden, seeing it this way hasn't allowed it to change. So the only thing I can do is what I can control. Like that's how that transitioned. I mean, I think on some degree, even now where we're at in our personal development, we still kind of do that, right? Mm -hmm. To some degree. It's not as intense as it used to be, 
But I will say there are moments where it's like, well, X, Y, Z happened. So that's why I'm reacting this way. And that's definitely how I operated in that marriage. You know, I was like, oh, he never took me took takes me out on dates. And so now I don't feel pretty or I don't feel worthy. And like I what could have been done different is me learning how to be more comfortable and confident in my skin and learning how to treat and love myself versus relying on someone to provide that love for me. So I think, and, and he was older than me. So it, I feel like had he done some other character development, which he hated any help, didn't like self-help, didn't like, uh, what is it? Therapists. I remember when I suggested a couple couples therapy, he fucking lost his shit. I, I think if he had had that, maybe he could have helped me, you know, guide myself along the way. But without any consciousness of both of our ends, there was no way I was going to see that side of me. So instead, I took it as a as a fuck you. I will figure it out how to make myself feel pretty and sexy. And in that way, I guess I did kind of teeter on the side of entertaining other men in what way i would flirt i would you know like i was a flight attendant while we were married and so i would go out to these bars by myself and just flirt i'm like never took anybody back thank god because i could have been ugh, first of all gross Second of all, <laughs> not not my character i definitely would have regretted it but yeah i mean i teetered on it would exchange numbers and then you know completely block them after and like just you know dumb shit that i'm just like just for that hit of validation because you weren't receiving it from at home yeah absolutely i think you even to some degree might know what i'm talking about yeah very much i just <laughs> didn't want to take the mic because it's about, <laughs> about you but I, I did something very similar you know as a police officer in uniform with you know women approaching me Oh my God, Often. that's kind of the same like being a flight attendant <clears throat> oh, yeah. when I yeah, was the, in the, uniform. It's the same desire of like, you want to have sex with a police officer, you want to have sex with a flight attendant, 100%. So that's funny. we're having people throw themselves at us all the time. Yeah. And we were in a relationship, at least for the last couple of years of it, where we didn't feel wanted and desired. And yeah. so uh, it would totally make sense because we have an understanding of each other in some of those ways and what, we, what each other need where we're mm. able to maintain certain elements of a relationship because we know that it's required in a way. Mm. That's why we're so, well, I feel like it's also our personality traits to just be loving the way that we are. But we also, I think we spend extra time to let each other know that we love and care and cherish yeah. and think each other are sexy or, yeah. you know, no, we, f we flirt a lot. We, yeah, there's like words of affirmation there's butt slaps. There's <laughs> I think you're you're getting really far, far down the butt slap routine. It's like you're <laughs> greeting now. He doesn't just hug me. It's hug. Uh, or like when he's walking by, butt slap. It's literally every minute now. Hey. I'm like, okay. Hey, I'll stop Even doing it. I'll when stop I was going in for my first, what is it? Yesterday when I was going into Zinke, he comes up and the first thing he does is put his hand on my butt. <laughs> it was on your side. It was on your side. I think you stopped I have, yourself. I may have had like a finger on the <laughs> cheek, but the, it was a lot more professional. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that, I think we have lots of sex. We yeah. dialed back for the sake of like testosterone and hormones and stuff and like are a little bit more yeah. controlled about it. But uh, I think all of that is like, in a way, it's like, and it's it's not just sex we're connecting yeah. deeply and like it's an expression of love and desire for each other and things of that nature I think is really important and I think that we've both been in relationships where that was uh, lacking or almost non-existent yeah. to a level 100%. where like, I never want you to feel like I know what it feels like to not feel wanted and I never want you to feel that way yeah right? I feel the same Yeah, so. so it's powerful but without knowing what something feels like in that way, you can't understand it enough to make sure that you provide it at that level. Oh, yeah. Or maybe you can't, but I think that it serves us in a way, in a way, so. I don't think, I don't, you mean you can't, you don't know what you don't know. It's as yeah. simple as that. It's not in your spectrum. Yeah. So, 
Okay, so we've kind of gone all the way to present. We kind of skipped through the, you know, some of the other stuff that took place during your marriage, which was the, or maybe at the end of it, and as you were coping with it, was the fitness, mm. right? So, you, oh, but yeah. you were also doing that well, being a flight attendant and going through a divorce, <laughs> right? So, take us through a bit of that experience, and like. In, in a way that for anybody who either is going through a divorce, uh, is doing fitness competition, or maybe recovering from a fitness competition, or considering doing it, mm. and then maybe even flight attendants who are in relationships, right? There's a, probably a lot of value there that you can provide as far as your experience, how you navigate it, mm -hmm. probably a lot of maybe mistakes you even made yeah. in that, that uh, maybe could help somebody prevent them doing it, or just help them navigate through what they're experiencing. So there's a lot of that in that question. Yeah. A lot of, I mean, honestly, if I were to really deep dive into all of it, it would probably take quite some time. <laughs> you can do a whole but, other episode just on that, but for uh, yeah, now, maybe some, some big golden nuggets, maybe. So I think my, and even when, when you just said it, I was a flight attendant. I was going through a divorce. I was going in a fitness competition, which means, one, I was losing a lot of sleep. Two, my diet was slim to none. And then three, I was going through emotional stress. I was under a lot of stress and I continued to pack things onto my schedule. So I think my huge takeaway from that experience and looking back at it now is slow the fuck down. Like genuinely take time to heal and understand your emotions because what I was doing was I was on hyperactive mode. I was on edge every fucking minute of every day. It fucked up my gut health. I mean, granted, okay, things in my external world were changing through brute force, right? Because I was forcing myself into this competition. I won, which felt like a win, but internally I was destructive. I was drinking, I was fucked up in the head, like I wasn't okay. And all of that was because I needed to distract myself. And the fitness was a distraction. The going into the competition was a distraction. The flights leaving, I left to be a flight attendant because I wanted to get out of that relationship and I just didn't know how. And I just overloaded myself too much. And so I think it really postponed my personal development mentally, which I think is the most important thing. And then obviously your physical as well. But I think it postponed a lot of that development because I was never able to quiet my mind and actually hear what it is that my soul wanted, not what my mind thought I should do. And so I think that's one of my biggest things is when you are going through something stressful and heavy mentally, physically, take time to rest. Take time to actually hear what your body and your soul needs because it's gonna speak to you and it's gonna come out in some way or another and it could be destructive or it could be beautiful. And I think I went the destructive route. As far as the divorce, huh, I mean, I, I dealt with it through putting myself through more pain, which is fucked up in its own way. I, I thought I deserved it. I thought that, I don't know, like the pain was comforting to me on some degree. I, I actually enjoyed putting my body through the physical pain so I didn't have to deal with the emotional. And so that's probably why I started my fitness competition. One, to prove to myself that I could do something outside of that relationship because I felt like I put everything into that relationship. And then two, it was, it was just a way for me to feel like something better could happen in my life because it was dark. I was dark. And I went on a lot of dates during that time to try and get over that divorce. And none of them were satisfying because I wasn't satisfied with myself. So, yeah, it was just, it was, it was painful. And divorces are painful as much as like people, I know some people get it, go through the divorce and they're like, oh my God, thank God, you know. But it wasn't that case for me. It was a painful divorce because it was, it was amicable. We both decided that we just couldn't figure it out. 
there was no cheating. There was no like defining moment where it was like, we're so fucked up to each other. Like we genuinely tried for like a year after we got the divorce. I don't think I realized that how similar our journeys were. Just mine was I think longer in a way, Mm -hmm. but um, it ended very similar. Yeah. And then it almost makes it more painful. Because I feel like yeah. I feel like I would have been able to move on faster if if he cheated. If there was a defining or if there moment. was a defining yeah. moment, yeah. but because there wasn't, it was so long and dragged out. And even when I was like trying to date, it was like my heart and mind was still connected to this man, and the failed image of our marriage. It's interesting because I guess for, on the other side, for me, it was like we really tried everything, and so it was like there was peace. That was there. Yeah. There was peace and love and appreciation for each other. Like hmm. we we did it. We fell out of love through, you know, resentment and all these things that took place, mm-hmm. but still had love for each other and appreciation as like a huge part of each other's life. Hmm. Where because we didn't do anything bad to each other, that would create the opposite of love, which hmm. would be hate where you don't want to. So in a way. I guess it, it's, Did you guys never get in any like intense fights where you like destroyed each other? I mean, there was maybe two, three arguments throughout our entire relationship, and all three of them happened happened after my partner was killed and I was becoming an alcoholic. Mm, so it'd be like on the way home from somewhere, I was drunk. I get triggered on something and I'd get out of the car and fucking walk six miles home by myself or walk to my office and sleep on the couch. Hmm, and like the that makes sense. He's <laughs> <laughs> always trying to jump out of moving cars. Stop. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, yeah, so. yeah, that's... I, I can't say the same. We were... We, we said a lot of things that you cannot take back in a relationship. I, th- I think the... So... Because it was during our relationship, not none of nothing happened that really hurt each other. But once we split, and I went to Barcelona, mm. and she learned about what was developing there, that's the first time that she was hurt mm. and lashed out and was like, wanted me to feel what she felt, mm. and so that's where things were expressed. From her standpoint, that were like, at a, like seeing a whole different side of her that I had never seen for six, seven years. Yeah. Right. Wow. Because I had never hurt her. She never hurt, felt hurt because of my behavior. Mm. Right. Um, I think that was just like it actually settling, setting in, like what was actually taking place after so long. You know. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, but. Yeah, I think overall, obviously, the amicably splitting ways uh, and it was fairly similar, but obviously the the actual um, journeys were different. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we were engaged, right? Yeah. Like, that was a whole thing, and then I think throughout the last two years of that, it was like, I think we both knew Yeah. that, that was like, there was no wedding that was coming. Yeah. Was, right. It was just like there was yeah. no planning. Talk like talked about it after the first like eight months of engagement. Mm. You know, because was it five six months later was when uh, Milto was killed. Yeah. Right after the engagement. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, that's right. So, anyways, now something I did want to ask you is, you felt doubt when you said yes. Oh yeah, I forgot I told you that. Yeah. Yeah. And you and you went through that anyways. Do you feel like there's any part of your upbringing and what you saw, how your mom operated, that could have played a role in you just trying to stick it out? Like, how long did you know? Was it from the beginning, or was it? you know, two years in that you knew but just didn't have any idea on how to get out? Ooh, okay. So we, he proposed a year of being together within a year or on our year anniversary, actually. And 
right before that, I think like maybe a couple days before that, we had a pretty big fight that was not like an anger infused fight. It was a saddened fight because of our desires in the future. So meaning to say he had completely different dreams. I had completely different dreams and they didn't line up. They actually were so far off. I have big dreams. I still have big dreams. And he had very, you know, let's go to New York and get like a small house and, and, uh, and, and just, you know, get by and just live a peaceful life, which there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not what I wanted. Um, especially not at that age either. I'm like, I have so much energy. I could fucking, I could run a lap around the world and still keep going. Like, so we had a huge fight in, you know, wanting to match up our, our futures or our desires, but it wasn't matching up. And so I remember having a moment where we talked about actually ending it because our differences were too much. And I remember crying. I remember listening to this. <sighs> Megan Trainer was one of the songs. It was like almost is never enough. I believe was it Megan Trainer? I think it was. But it's the. It was basically saying almost is never enough, and it was like I remember playing that song on repeat because I'm like, fuck, it's not. Like it's, we're not gonna make it, and so. I don't even know what happened the next day. We somehow recovered from it, and it was like it never happened, and like days or maybe a week later it, there was a proposal he was on his knee and I'm like what the fuck is happening I remember I was slightly intoxicated slightly I mean I was probably pretty intoxicated and when he proposed you know it's an emotional moment and I was emotionally charged and I had alcohol in my system so immediately I was like yeah but there was a moment that I felt like I just I knew I shouldn't have said yes but by the time I said yes I was like there's no way I'm taking this back I can't and so I just never left and I we ended up getting married doing the whole courthouse thing so that's a, that, that posed a really good question because you you s decided you can't take this back and that decision took you on a journey mm -hmm. you you were at a fork in the road and it was either go this way and stick with what you said, keeping your word, which is honorable, honorable in a way, or this other route. Mm -hmm. Is there any regret there? Or if not, what did that give you that serves you today? No regrets. I think everything is divinely timed now that I'm where I'm at in my mental development. Um, and... I learned a lot of things since then. I learned one, self-worth and being able to stick to what you actually believe feels right in your gut. Like saying no, I learned how to say no. I didn't, I wouldn't, I didn't know at that time that I stuck to the path because I said yes. And I was like, okay, I'm going to stick to this path. Knowing that now, like having more increased self-worth, I would have backed out. I would have said no, but I learned that lesson through saying yes. I was able to be a flight attendant. I went all around the fucking world. I got to go see my parents off of my flight attendant benefits. I hadn't seen my dad in 10 years. I got to, there was just so many things. I gained one of my best friends and we're not friends anymore, but at the time I needed her and, and it was very beneficial for me. I needed that friendship. I needed that relationship. And vice versa. And vice versa, we needed each other. There's just so many different things like I, I got to explore and see and learn about myself. I was challenged in, a, in ways that would have never happened if I didn't say yes to that marriage. Mm -hmm. What do you feel is the best part of that relationship? Like if you look back mm -hmm. and you're like, that was, that was great. Like that part of it that like you like take with you or the good, the best thing you remember of it. Hmm, that's a good question. The best thing I remember from it. I think two things. One, which is kind of a weird answer, it actually, he actually helped me open up my eyes to how corrupt the world is and the government because he was in the military 
and I saw a lot of the structures and things that weren't right for humans. And he caused me to question a lot of things, which is why I voted for Trump, which is why mm. like that whole thing, like I started diving into how fucked up the government is. And without him being such a rebel, I wouldn't probably wouldn't have questioned it. And so that actually helped me to open up my eyes on that side of the world. And then the other side, I feel like I actually learned a lot of peace in some of the simple things in life. Because I'd always been reaching for these big giant dreams and very monetized, like everything was monetarily valued. And I think when I, I remember a memory of going back to New York with him and and just being in this house with a big yard and we would catch crickets and throw it into the lake. And it was just fun and peaceful and quiet. And it didn't require money. It didn't require anything fancy. I was literally just, it was just me and nature. And I think that he in some ways taught me the, the beauty and simplicity of life sometimes. That's cool. So in a way, you put a crack in the programming mm. and your programming. Yeah. That and it's in its own way, as you start to explore, started to crack more and more and really break it all down. And like over the years, it broke it down. But that was like kind of that first crack yeah. in the in the foundation. Yeah. That was, it was that like was something that splintered. From, yeah. Into more. 100%. And then, and then contentment in, in like simple things in life in a way. Where yeah. Like kind of maybe your first taste of that where now you can remember that and be like, oh, yeah, like life can be good mm -hmm. with very little as well. Yeah. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. So things to be grateful for from that. I mean, it seems like there's a lot. There's not... a lot more, I'm, I'm sure, Especially if I really... Now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, you've gone on this wild ride. Now you've, you've gotten through the divorce and you are... You moved during this, correct? I was in Chicago and he was in Tucson. Okay, yeah. so when did you move to Arizona or back to Arizona? Ooh, uh, about three years ago. That was about a year and a half after my divorce. Okay, so around like beginning of 2020, so right around the same time I moved to Arizona. I think like 2019. Okay. Yeah. End of 2019? Just about. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so you move here. You're still a flight attendant? Was still a flight attendant. Okay. It brings and through that transition because then you leave being a flight attendant after two years, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was in Chicago for two years being a flight attendant. I was at the tail end of my divorce and I was trying to figure out where I wanted to live because I had saved up enough money to purchase a home, buy a house. And so I was like, okay, cool. I want to buy a house. I know it's a good investment. I wanted it to be my first investment property. And I was looking at two places. I was looking at Charleston, which is where my ex lived, because I thought maybe we could make it work. <laughs> Fucking idiot. And then the other option was Phoenix, because I went to college in Tucson. And I remember liking Phoenix a lot. And I knew a realtor out here. So... Obviously, I had, a, I had a layover out here and I was like, okay, I'm going to explore Phoenix and explore it on a more, like more deeply because I had com come up here occasionally from Tucson just to check it out, but like maybe an hour to two hours max. So came out here, got to see all the cool sights and things and really had to like sit with myself and figure out <laughs> what the fuck am I actually doing? Like, am I, am I really going to move to Charleston and be... 45 minutes away from my ex so that I can visit him when he's not like we're going through a divorce. What the fuck were you thinking? So I chose Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, I chose Phoenix and um, I was still a flight attendant at the time. Yes. And I was hoping that I was going to get a transfer from Chicago to Phoenix. I closed on the house and literally a day after we got an email saying that they're no longer taking any, there's no more open spots for flight attendants at the Phoenix base. And it was unforeseeable because this is one of the biggest uh, American Airlines bases 
and wow. seniority has taken up Phoenix. So I'm like, holy fuck, I just bought a house. I have to commute. So the way flight attendants work is you have your home base and you always have to start and end your trips at this home base. So what my life would look like if I had stayed a flight attendant is I would come to Phoenix for what, two, three days, go out to Chicago, then start my three day trip and then go back to Chicago and then come back here to live for three days. Whatever, if I can fix over my schedule over and over, again. over and over and again. So you want to talk about a long commute? That was a long fucking commute. Because longest. <laughs> yeah, well, because yeah, I would even have to drive my car, park it at the parking spot out here, take the trolley to the train, take the train to Chicago, Chicago, go fly my three day trip, go back to Chicago, take the trolley. <laughs> like, it was like this whole fucking mess. So some people drive like forty five minutes, an hour <laughs> to work. I took Maybe like hour a whole day. If you're in L A. Yeah, but. I took a whole day. And not only that, because Phoenix is such a busy hub and we fly standby, sometimes it, I couldn't get in the same day. Like I would be stuck at the airport for six hours before I could even get like I'd have to plan a whole day ahead of my three day trip to get there. Anyways, that's a whole thing. So basically that fucking sucked hearing that news. I even recorded like a video somewhere somewhere in my computer about how like fucked up that it was but also in its own way very divine because i sat with myself and i was like okay do i actually want to be a flight attendant much longer am i happy being a flight attendant and am i willing to make this commute every fucking month for the foreseeable future for the foreseeable future with no end in mind so what i did and american airlines don't hate me for this <laughs> is I had never used a sick day in all the two years. Never used a sick day. And I used the fuck out of it the last couple of trips. So the way the trips work is you have like, you get your whole month schedule and you have like maybe a trip here, a trip here, but you can like pick up other people's trips and basically make it so that you're working two weeks straight and then two weeks off. And basically whenever a trip started, I'd call in sick. That would end the whole sequence. And then I'd call in sick again. But it only took up like so many sick days. So I did that for probably three months on sick leave. Yeah, I, I arranged nice. it so perfectly. <laughs> but yeah, it was paid sick leave. So I was getting paid while I was like establishing my life here in Phoenix. And I was pursuing uh, becoming a real estate agent during that time. While you were finishing up those, those three months. Right. Because I needed something. And I knew I wasn't going to go back to the workforce. There's no fucking way. So I, what I started to study for my real estate, um, and I was relentless fucking studying. I took that real estate test twenty times and failed. Twenty. 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 How do they tests. allow you to take it that many times? You can just, uh, uh, is it unlimited? Well, so there's there is. Uh, how, how long is this test that you took twenty times? It's like one hundred and fifty questions, something like that. Did you take it every day for twenty days until you figure out. I took it like every every like weekend. Got it. I took like two tests every weekend. So what you have to do to get your real estate license is you have to first pass a school test and then they allow you to take the state test. So the school test is not charged, thank God, because now they charge every time you fail. Before, I, they didn't. So I took the test over and over and over and over. Um, and I was fucking, I went through deep depression, like not being able to figure it out. I'm like, I have nowhere else to go no other job options like I would literally spend my entire day just fucking studying over and over and over and over and I wasn't getting it and so that just shows how fucking stubborn I am because I took or it 20 times perspective here or resilient no resilient very resilient persistent <laughs> driven dedicated committed <laughs> ambitious you badass. do a lot when your back is when you're backed up against a corner and so, yeah, I took the test 20 times, <laughs> finally passed. I was two points away from failing again. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. I, like, my first, I applied for 25-plus police departments. At first got rejected from all of them beforehand. So. <laughs> we have such synchronicities. That's crazy. That's why we're together. Yeah, keep going. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I took it 20 times, and then when I first, when I took the state test for the first time, I fucking passed. 
and that was the one that actually mattered because it would um i would have to pay i think like a hundred bucks to okay. retake it so i was like thank god um and yeah i walked away with my real estate license that day and was happy about that and did real estate for two years how was that experience because you went from flight attendant which is like it's not as masculine no. as as real estate because there's not as much uh action that you have to like push yourself to do it's like you, you know with flight attendant you have a set schedule mm-hmm. you, and you just have to show up you gotta do your job and then go home right. whereas real estate uh it's and also you're around more women in as a flight attendant whereas uh in real estate you're in, in even more of a masculine environment mm-hmm. right Mm, yeah real estate was my heavy masculine boss babe fucking era (laughs) i completely went into i don't even know how to explain it i was a fucking rabid dog i'm just kidding that's a horrible way to explain it but i was (laughs) i was intense i mean i it's all i cared about it's all i wanted to do is make more money and more money i was I was flexing my peacock feathers with how much money I was making. And I'm like, I remember when my flight attendant friends would hit me up and they're like, oh, you know, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm a six figure earner, bitches. I'm like, I'm not flying anymore. (laughs) Like I was I was I was a man. And it also affected my dating because I would not settle for anyone who was making less than me. That was for sure. Like because I wanted a man man. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to date someone who who wasn't at least bringing the same amount of income as me so that and i really was just so independent i got my own like loft on the lake and it was my favorite place still to this day and yeah i was just fucking i was i felt like a badass after going through a divorce after losing um, one of my longer friendships, after like just everything that I'd gone through, real estate was like my, I think I figured it out kind of thing. Okay, so during that time, you got into another relationship mm. for yeah. a year. Yep. Um, from what it seems like may have been prematurely. Yeah. And, um, then also was only doing real estate for a couple of years, right? Yep. Okay. We, he was my, he was my realtor actually. And kind of got me into it in, on some level. I mean, I always wanted to because my dad was in real estate after he left the Navy. Um, not successful with it, but <laughs> neither here nor there. And yeah, so we ran our own, it was like a two man team and we fucking, we're making deals like no other. We were slanging it. And definitely was a premature relationship. I think because I went on so many dates that were absolutely horrid, um, I ended up with this man who I, I actually knew him before. Like we were friends before I was married, before I even like we were friends for a very long time. And so it was comfortable. It felt safe. And it felt like that was as good as it was going to get because after dating so many men, I was like, yeah, you know, you just kind of get tired of it. I was so sick and tired of dating. And I found a guy who I trusted genuinely as a friend. And I was like, okay, well, like explore this. And so I ended up in that relationship and obviously it didn't work out because it was, you know, what's funny though, I didn't think it was premature when I got into the relationship. We were already almost, uh, we were split already for almost two years. And the divorce finalized while I was in that relationship. And when the divorce finalized and I got the call, I was in Chicago. And then it reopened up the wound of my failed marriage. And then it felt like it was premature. I remember calling my friend, I'm like, I shouldn't be fucking hurting like this, but I just got the finalized paperwork. We're officially divorced and this hurts way more. Like even now, (laughs) I'm not even sad about it, but I think it just re re recover, it like brings up the pain I felt at that moment. I felt like helpless. I feel like that's understandable though. Yeah. Like 
I mean, wounds, even if you are over that person, mm-hmm. right? Um, the, there's loss involved. There's the perception of failure, which you've used that word before. Mm-hmm. Um, even though you know that you shouldn't have said yes in the first place. Yeah. But you then went on a pursuit to make it work. Yeah. And put a lot of energy into it and time. And so there can even be grief of the time and the energy that mm-hmm. was put into it for it to then be perceived as wasted, which I think is just kind of us deep in our ego. Yeah. You know, because I think when we separate ourselves from that, we're like, no, we know it very much was, you know, very divine and, yeah. and gave us so much, like you've already said, even just during this conversation. So, but. I uh, think it, I think it also really plays into the, the idea of, our bodies don't actually recognize time, right? Like, I could know very consciously that obviously that relationship wasn't going to work. And it, and even to this day, like when I think about how I felt that pain, it's not because I miss him. It's like my body recalls that memory as mm-hmm. if it's present. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you guys have ever like watched yourself. If you ever recorded yourself crying and you watch yourself cry, you feel it again. Yeah. Well, like, the, with with painful memories, right? The it, it attaches the emotion to it. So when you do recall it, the emotion comes with it, mm-hmm. right? Until you separate it, which is a part of uh, is an actual healing process. Right. And I, I mean, yeah, our our body is just when we when we associate a memory with it, that's it sticks. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that was a that was a painful time in my life, and then I was like really starting to think about my ex-husband while I was in this relationship I would hear love songs and while he was talking about how he wants you know to me to be that person who like we're singing love songs to each other I was thinking about my ex-husband and I'm like fuck like there's something severely wrong with me and I was upset that I was even thinking it because I was emotionally in my head cheating and then also Mm -hmm. Randomly, my ex finally did, he did hit me up because there had been months, like almost a year actually, where he didn't message me back or anything. And I was like, okay, we're officially done. Then he hits me up while I was on a date with my ex man. And uh, I remember going to the bathroom and like hearing the voicemail. And he was like, hey, I saw online that you are now a sponsored athlete um at optimum nutrition because i finally got my dream i talked about it for a long time being a sponsored athlete and so he said he because he was looking himself up because he does photography for the military and i popped up because i still have his last name or still i kept his last name holy fuck i forgot that detail i literally kept his last name because i didn't want to get rid of that memory i was so attached to this marriage And I was like, there's no part of me that wants to erase it. And so I kept his last name. And so when my name went on the roster as a sponsored athlete, uh, his last name popped up and he found me. And so he called me and just wanted to congratulate me. But obviously that opened a whole other door. Do you feel like that was, uh, there was any malintent in that and him calling you? Uh, and trying to like keep a hook in you or do you feel like it was a very genuine like because did he know you were in a relationship did he know anything about where you were at in life or was it just this like I'm gonna call her and congratulate her I don't think there was any malintent I don't think he knew I was in a relationship I don't know maybe he checked my Instagram or something but um I don't think he did it didn't feel like it was intended for us to work out i think he genuinely just wanted to congratulate me because he knew that that was something that i'd been working on Mm. but i will say because it did open the door we did start talking and there was a night actually where i was like parked outside of the house and i was still on the phone with him and my ex who i was dating at the time came out and heard me talking to him so I was like kind of in a way cheating and um yeah it was and I was angry at him for <laughs> intruding on my space <laughs> that's okay. insane okay, hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> I was you know yeah I just I don't know 
still leave me. Yeah. So was that the beginning of the end of that relationship? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, because that night I had to talk to the guy I was dating at that time, and we had a deep conversation about what I wanted. And he basically gave me an ultimatum and said, you know, if I want to talk to my ex, then that can be pursued. But then that means, like, we have to end our relationship. And me just trying to do what felt right, which I, I, at the time, now that I think about it, I ultimately didn't want to be with anyone. But I chose him, my my ex not my ex-husband yeah because i knew that that was something that like i'm like i'm not opening that door again so got it and so that relationship ended and did you stay how long did you stay in real estate after that um maybe a year so a year of being in real estate but completely done with your ex yeah my ex-boyfriend yeah yeah um and I wasn't like heavy in real estate because at that point I had established a nest egg. So that was when I was like, okay, I'm splitting up from this relationship. I'm doing what feels right for me. I actually, I was living with my best friend at the time and I had her like move with me everywhere. But when I split up, I said that I was doing this for me. So I got my own place. That's when I got that loft on the lake. And like I was like, I need to do something for me and be selfish for a minute because I'd given everything to everyone. And so I, yeah, I basically broke up with my best friend, at least living with her. I left that relationship. I was kind of dabbling in real estate with previous clients and like friends and family, but I wasn't heavily seeking clients anymore. And I took the year off to explore other options. And like, I really just wanted to play video games and stream on Twitch and create content. Like, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make videos. Which you so, did. Which I did. Yeah. On and off. God, that well, that's a whole fucking journey. Yeah. Like, <laughs> basically knowing in your soul, like, what you actually fucking want, but then ignoring it for so many years because it didn't seem logical. And, and it also wasn't, from what I understand, it wasn't supported in your marriage or in most of your relationships as far as the content creation, right? No, no, not at all. Well, when I was married, I don't know if that, that passion really came up as much. I feel like... Was suppressed or was it just you were on a path of further discovery, self-discovery? I think it was both. I think I gave so much. I My whole life was this man. Like, I wanted his dreams to be sought out. I was willing to move wherever he wanted to go. Um, I actually didn't really care what I did. I was like, okay, you want to go to Syracuse and, like, uh, do this program. Okay, then I'll go and I'll find a job out there. And I, I was so flexible with what I actually wanted. And I had put into my mind that, the dreams I had was outlandish and because I chose to marry this man who doesn't want that then I better figure out the alternative why were you why do you feel like you were so willing to give up your dreams for his hmm I think even though I did not like this from my mom she gave up her dreams to marry my dad like he actually went up to her because my mom was a beautiful singer she had an opportunity to travel the world and like become a singer which is what she wanted to do but when my dad came back to marry her my dad gave my mom an ultimatum said either you marry me and we start a family and we move to the states or you can continue your singing career and my mom was like well, I guess I'll marry you and go to the States. But she always resented him for it. She was always like, your dad never let me pursue my dreams and da-da-da. And I think on a very subconscious level, I was reliving the same life that my mom had created. Oh, my God. Sorry, that was just like a realization. My dad was military, too. 
Mm. So was my mom or my ex-husband. Wow. And I was willing to do and be the sacrifice that I despised in my mom from subconscious programming. That's insane. Wow. And and that fear of reliving that has come up in our relationship. Mm, absolutely. Quite a bit. Even yeah. even if I am super supportive and literally was trying to support us so that you could just pursue it. Yeah. It's still like any even ounce of, of that reality coming back in, there's a lot of resistance there. I think it's because it's a big fear. Yeah. Like I don't ever want to feel like I have to choose between my love and passion for somebody else Mm -hmm. because it's not your dream it's mine and i'm like at the end of the day if i sacrifice that then i sacrifice myself and if i don't have myself what do i have to give yeah i think that's like also where i mean we were when we first started dating we were very open and honest about what we wanted and there was so much alignment like we couldn't ignore it yeah i was actually surprised yeah i remember like i thought you were gonna be a hippie (laughs) i was like he's gonna want to just be a van traveler and he doesn't even want a big house like because i wanted a big yeah so when we went on our first date or when 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 you came over whatever you guys don't judge me um my fault. Yeah. yeah, I was actually pleasantly surprised to know that what your desire was for the future. And fucking giant dreams. Yeah. Well. I'm like, oh. I'm like, you guys. Not just dreams. I'm like, I'm actually going to do this. Yeah. It's like, this is what my plan is, and this is what's actually going to happen. Yeah. I'm curious He's what yours fucking... is. And it was like, oh, I'm actually trying to do the same exact things. Boom, 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 boom. It was like, yeah. well, damn. Yeah. Okay. It was cool. And coming from my past relationships recognizing when there was no alignment i was like okay we have some alignment (laughs) that's interesting because i in my last relationship it wasn't necessarily that there was full alignment in dreams there was just full support and not a conflict in them so Mm. right so there was that, and but I will say that pretty much everybody close to me, Gabby, Joey, like those like really close, were saying that like that relationship is weighing you down. Like, like mm. there's there's a not a match in where you're actually going. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so that was like the first thing that Gabby said to me. It was like, you found your, your match and where you're going. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Got chills. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but back to you. So I, I've been trying no. to do a good job at making sure that this is just all I, about you because I want everybody to like actually get to know the incredible human being that I know. And I've even gotten to learn some new stuff from you. And uh, this, you know, it's given me the opportunity to ask you some questions that uh, I guess in a different setting I would uh, I haven't thought of yet so um, I'm enjoying it I enjoy our conversation when when you chime in yeah um, but I'm just you know just trying, I know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess I, I mean I feel like there's a lot that we can still cover we're at an hour and a half uh, I feel like instead of going down an entire road around our relationship and dating and things of that nature, um, because I think that could add on another hour and a half. Absolutely. That could be a whole another episode. Yeah, I think we could do a full episode just as far as like our dating experience. Um, But I think... We should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think... And maybe even have somebody else interview us. Ooh. Yeah. That would be cool. I think what I'd love to end this on and over the next whether it's 10 minutes or 20, 30 minutes, <laughs> is really some things about you that, like, really you. Not maybe, like, your past or things of that nature. Like, I think something we didn't, we didn't touch on as far as your past is you've had a camera in your hand since you were a kid, mm. right? Um, so maybe, maybe you could touch on some stuff around that because I think that kind of shows, like, listen, this isn't some fucking 
thing that you're just like obsessed with right now. It's, this isn't a phase. Mm-hmm. This has been, this is a purpose. This is uh, a path. This is something you signed up to come here to do in some way. And, and yes, you've gone on all these different um, detours throughout your life, but like it is exceedingly obvious that you are meant to create content and entertain in some way. And that is how you uh, express yourself and bring your light to the world. Right. Mm. Um, so I guess with, I'm, now I'm telling everybody instead of you telling them. <laughs> um, but I just, I think that there are some parts of you and like your heart and like really just who you are at your core and what you want to bring to the world that I believe others deserve to hear straight from you. Hmm. Well, um, when it comes to feeling my purpose and my purpose being grounded in entertainment, I feel like each one of us has a, a, uh, a harmony, if you will, that speaks to our souls, that matches our, our vibration, our heart. And I think I knew mine because when I was a kid, I was always standing on top of the tables. I was like trying to perform. I had a fake camera and I would like take pictures of things and I had a video camera and I made video vlogs and I would I would record and do voiceovers for my dogs. I created I created a whole movie with my dogs, by the way. And <laughs> it was like their life and I narrated their life for them. It was wild. Is this, is this on VHS somewhere? I just can't find the tapes. I gotta ask my parents if they have it. Yeah. But I have a lot of like video vlogs and stuff. And when I look back at it, I even found this old picture of my dad where I'm like standing on a chair and we're looking through this video camera that's on a stand. And it's like, it's a very like, whole, like heartfelt, like, holy shit, I've actually been interested in this since I was like three like a baby and I think each one of us has if we really really deep dive into who we were as children and how we played as children we can actually really rediscover what our soul's harmony is and but that takes a lot of work right because we leave it we leave it for logic we leave it for safety we leave it for security but if we can find a way to be comfortable with those things and can rediscover our playfulness as children, I think we can rediscover our harmony. And I think that's what has happened over the years. I fucking went 20, 50,000 different directions. And it wasn't until I felt more self-worth to that I was willing to accept my harmony because my harmony didn't feel lo- logical. Like starting a YouTube video, I wanted to start a YouTube video. Channel. Video. Yeah, a YouTube channel. Since YouTube first came out, Like I wanted to leave college. I wanted to just make videos, but logically my business mind was like, well, that's not gonna make me any money or the chances or the odds of me actually being successful in this field is slim to none. So I went the logical route. And so it's easy to get strayed from that because there's a lot of other things in our physical world and our external world that needs to be satisfied for us to be able to listen to what we actually want internally. So I I took a very long route Um, but I think what I'm so happy about now, even with the journey that I took, so there's moments where I'm like, fuck, I, I fucking went and wasted 10 years when I could have been doing this 10 years ago. (laughs) But I think what I'm happy about is the amount of tools and education and experiences in life that I got to experience within those 10 years. And now I feel like I'm coming back at my passions and more more in harmony and more in sync on a stronger vibration and stronger level than I ever used to be. Like I'm fired up, I fucking, cause now I've tried everything. There is no other way. There is no other questioning or doubt of like, oh yeah, I could probably do this. No, you fucking did that. Surprise, it didn't fucking work out because you don't care about it. That's just the truth. And so now, I'm like full set on my passions, full set on that. And I'm super excited to be able to encourage people to do the same. I think a lot with my messaging, I mean, if you go through my stuff, it's very like positive and mindset, but it's also very raw and real because 
this process, our fucking experience here in life is not all rainbows and butterflies. Like we can kid around and act like we're always 100% on point and on, on our game. But I, I mean, I stumbled 80% of the way <laughs> and the 20% I was on full sprint. Like, <laughs> but I just, I guess I want people to really feel where I'm coming from and just understand that like life will get its hands on you but it's up to you to decide if that's going to continue to bring you in the opposite direction of your harmony or will you go towards your harmony and we make that decision every day through our actions through our habits I think yeah I just want people to fucking fall in love with themselves again I feel like there has been Ooh, even think about it. I'm like, there's so many times I didn't love myself and I didn't want to play anymore and I didn't want to like explore, be curious because I thought that that's just what happens in the world. Like I was convinced that the older you get, just the more miserable you get. And a lot of us are like that. A lot of us feel that way. That's so not the truth. I feel like if we could just open up our hearts to our playful nature be fucking curious like stop expecting the world to be a certain way it's going to be that way because you're expecting it to be that way but i think if we could just open our mind and be curious about everything even like with you when i'm dating you i don't act like i ever know what's going to happen there's moments obviously we just had a conversation yesterday but it's like i try to be curious about you all the time that's why i always ask you about your day or like how did you feel about this because i think that curiosity keeps us kids at heart and I think our kid side of us and our playful nature is actually what speaks to our souls. So I hope that, I don't know, I hope that I can help people want to play again and find harmony with their souls. Is there anything else that you really want people to get out of your content? Like if there's one response that will forever keep you going because of that response or knowing that they're receiving that, like what is it? <laughs> it sounds funny but it's to laugh I want people to laugh I want people to laugh at me I want people to laugh with me I don't care if you're laughing it's typically a positive response and your body will probably receive it very positively and so me I I think laughter is a way to make life fucking magical whether it's like you're in sorrow and you're laughing at how fucking ridiculous it is. There's so many times I've been depressed and I'm like laughing at how fucking sad and sorry I've been for like a month. I'm like, really, Donna? You're, you're fucking, this is where you're at in life? It's kind of comical, right? I think everything in life within time is comical on some degree. We can laugh at it. And if you can laugh at it, that means you're probably over it. And now you can experience it and attach a positive reaction to it versus the negative and yeah I just I want people to laugh and laugh more laugh often and have fun with life because that's what else is life for if not to laugh and love oh my gosh I just said live laugh love that's basically what I said wow Martha Stewart cliche shit <laughs> it is very cliche but oh, I think fuck. it's also beautiful because like there's eight billion plus people in the world, I don't know what the population is now, but the amount of people who have the desire and passion and the result that they're pursuing is for others to laugh because it's going to bring joy to their life mm -hmm. and you want to bring joy to their life is beautiful. And I'm trying really hard not to dive deep into why that is because then it'll be another hour here. <laughs> <laughs> right, but <laughs> yeah, that's I think, true. I think either way, it was from a very young age. I think that there's that's not all uh, nurture. I think there's uh, its core nature, mm. soul purpose that is in that. And if there's any experiences that played a role, like whether it's trauma or love, or receiving love or anything as a kid, that it's probably just in support of it to really push you in mm -hmm. a way that you probably just signed up for. You know? Yeah. I believe it, too. Hmm. Laughter is absolutely part of my core. Yeah. I, I might even have to dive into that a little deeper myself. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe that will bring some, like, put even more wood on the fire. Yeah. Yeah. 
some things I'm realizing that uh, we didn't touch on that we'll leave as a cliffhanger is um, obviously our entire dating experience, the beginning of it specifically, I think is super imp- important and like and how I think it's there's developed. a lot to, to take for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the deep work that we've done, uh, first me, then you, between me hiring a coach, you being your own coach, um, I think the your relationship with women for yeah. a long time was very negative and even for yourself you the reason why we're having this is because you don't talk about yourself a lot but now you are more because you're opening up more yeah uh, so i think that's a whole topic uh which is also facilitated through this I, yeah. I feel like i'm sharing more because of con- like my art is creating more vulnerability for me yeah yeah it's like saving me yeah it's facilitating mm-hmm. uh, your own healing mm-hmm. and and growth as well uh and then i think we we skipped the uh, how you got from Cali to Tucson, um, mm. and um, oh yeah, I think there's probably a few other elements. I think even over the last year, very specific stuff that I almost thought maybe we could do a part two on mm. to touch on some of this stuff because I think there's a lot of connecting the dots that would then increase other people's awareness where they can draw parallels of their experiences in the past and how they show up and perceive and think and believe now in their life mm. and that could shift perspective or increase their own awareness to figure out why they show up certain ways and do certain things yeah. that would allow them to, with that awareness, create positive change in their life. Yeah. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, that was the, fun. It's weird being on the receiving end of this. <laughs> yeah, I hope I did a good job at extracting uh, as much information from Donna Gift as I could for you. I think, uh, you know, I may have asked three or four questions in one sometimes <laughs> that, where some stuff was missed, but uh, it's just because there's so many questions to ask. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you for being open, honest, vulnerable as you always are. And. Uh, I'm excited to rewatch this and also hear everybody's responses to finally getting to know the real Donna Gift. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. That is all. Until next time. See you guys on the next episode of the Donna, the Donna Gift, Gift Show. Show. <laughs> <laughs> that was so lame. <laughs>